And good morning, everyone. Welcome to GCFI 73. My name is Fadila Ali, and I'm the Assistant Executive Director of GCFI. Um, before we get started, here are a few tips to ensure that you have a good experience today. Um, on the bottom panel of your Zoom screen, um, you can see that there's a little world button. This is where you can click for interpretation. So please select which interpretation channel you wish to join, whether it be English or Spanish. Um, you can also use the chat box to make comments or greet other participants. And there, you will notice that there's also a question and answer box where you can direct all your questions to our keynote speaker. And we will be addressing these after his presentation. So I think we're going to get started um, as it's uh, 10 already. So welcome to the open of GCFI 73. And we're very pleased to have you here with us for our very first GCFI virtual conference. Our program this morning will consist of a live keynote speech by Rear Admiral T Tim Gallaudet on NOAA's strategy to respond to and prevent the spread of stony coral tissue loss disease. And then this will be followed by a live question and answer session where you, the audience, will be able to ask the Rear Admiral questions about his work. Then we'll finish up the morning with the annual GCFI membership meeting, which we encourage you to stay online for. Now, to get things started, I would like to introduce GCFI's Executive Director, Robert Glazer, to offer some opening words. Thank you, Fadila. Um, greetings, and I hope everybody's staying safe in these difficult times. Um, I just wanted to open this meeting and give everybody a, uh, a sort of heads up on, on how we got here and where we're going with this meeting. As those of you who have attended GCFI for many years know that this is not a traditional way that we uh, will have done GCFI and we hope it's not going to be the same going forward. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, our philosophy and how we developed this meeting. As many of you know who have attended the business meetings that we have had every year, and we hope that you will attend later this morning, uh, we have been doing quite well as a corporation and have uh, money in the bank. It has come up a number of times on about what we're going to do with some of those extra funds that have not been allocated. And we decided this year that this is the perfect opportunity to give back to the membership. We are using these funds that we have accumulated in order to have this conference proceed uh, free of charge to all of you. And we hope that you um, recognize that this is a, a valuable contribution that we are trying to make to the GCFI community and GCFI family. Um, this is really the philosophy that we've had uh, in, in accumulating these funds, and that is to save them for a rainy day, and this indeed is a rainy day. So I want to also talk about the, um, the agenda in this conference a little bit. You'll see that this is not normal, uh, a normal conference. We're not heavily focused on science, and that was purposeful. We, wanted to, we recognize that everybody here is um, living in a difficult time, trying to accomplish the science that is on their plate, or whatever activities they are doing. And so we wanted to sort of tune down the science a little bit and add some fun events to this conference. And we hope that we've done that. Uh, you'll see that we have Cinefish, which is uh, part of the um, ongoing GCFI conferences, but we also have added what we call a GCFI Story Slam. And we hope that all of you can attend this on Friday. This is meant to be a fun event that will sort of tell stories about sort of non-science stories about uh, funny events that happen in, in your field work. And we hope that this can be an ongoing activity going forward, maybe not as part of the conference, but maybe out of the cycle of the conference. Um, so I also wanted to uh, speak to um, a, a very tragic event that happened last week, and that is we lost one of our uh, strongest um, um, members of GCFI, a person who really embodied the whole spirit of GCFI, and that was Leroy Cresswell. Uh, he was probably an acquaintance to all of you, probably about the first person you saw when you came to the conference. He collected the manuscripts and, and rang the opening bell. But he also embodied so much more. I remember back in the late 1990s, sitting in the Dominican Republic with Leroy, having a beer in the old town. And we were talking about uh, how GCFI could be so much more. At that point, it was sort of, the proceedings were about four years overdue. And there were some, some, some things that were happening that weren't really um, we didn't know whether or not GCFI would continue at that time. 
And we said, you know, this is such a, a good organization that ha and it addresses such an important need for the region that maybe we should just, instead of complaining about it, do something about it. And Leroy took the, the reins and sort of really directed how we um, accomplished where we are now. Uh, it's only been become more popular as is evidenced by the over 400 people who are, have signed up to attend this conference. Um, Leroy is, was both a friend and a close colleague. Um, I learned a lot more about him than I ever knew uh, in the last um, two days. He, for example, um, he served on many, uh, he, was the, he was the past president of the Caribbean Aquaculture Association. He was the editor of the Caribbean Aquaculturist. He was the director of the World Aquaculture Society and he was also the president of that society. Um, he's been on the board of directors of GCFI for 18 years, and he uh, is a past president of National Shell Fisheries Association. Um, he was on the board of directors of Treasure Coast Environmental Education, and on and on and on. Um, but uh, he also um, was involved heavily in his community and making it a better place. Um, he started oyster restoration programs for the Indian River Lagoon, um, and he, uh, and he's done a number of other outstanding activities. He has over 30 peer-reviewed uh, peer publications, manuals, and a book that he has written. And so he is, beyond being just a great guy, he was also an accomplished uh, scientist and professional. And I, I find myself personally saying, I have to call Leroy and tell him about this that just happened. And of course, then the reality hits. So it's, it's a very sad moment for us here at GCFI. And uh, I know I speak for the entire board of directors in saying that we miss him. Uh, we had immense respect for him and we valued his participation and nobody will ever be able to fill that, that hole. Um, I'll turn it back over to uh, Fadila at this point. Thank you everybody and have a good conference. Thank you, Bob. Um, so moving on, we would like to introduce GCFI's acting chair of the board of directors, Emma Doyle, to offer some welcoming words. Thank you, Emma. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to give a really warm welcome to those of, you who, those of you who are joining us live today and an equally warm welcome to those listening in on a recording of our very first virtual GCFI meeting. Um, our hearts are with all of those in the GCFI family who've been affected by COVID-19. This year, we've been concerned not only for everyone's health, but also for the fishing communities who are facing changed livelihoods for MPA managers who are dealing with additional pressures, for the students and the scientists whose classes and field work have been so disrupted. And we're thinking also for our colleagues in government and NGOs who are charting a new course for their nations. This pandemic is limiting our face-to-face -face contact this year and putting a distance between many of us at a time when we would normally rejoice in coming together to share our professional progress and to reconnect personally at GCFI. This year, the passage of time has seen the loss of loved ones from the GCFI family. Sadly, our Executive Secretary, Leroy Cresswell, passed away. And our Chair, Martin Russell, has had a recent death in the family, which sees me acting in his place today. It all emphasises how precious and how treasured our connections are. Now, our enduring GCFI network really is significant. Although we can't physically meet for the 73rd Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute, the board didn't want to let the first week in November pass without us connecting, at least in an abbreviated format. Now, you might think that it's taken 73 years and a pandemic for GCFI to venture into the virtual meeting world. But in fact, our 2015 strategic plan first highlighted the imperative of going virtual to reach our audience around the region and around the world in a cost-effective and a low-carbon way. GCFI 68 in 2016 in Panama was our first live stream of an opening keynote. Now, GCFI's mission is to provide a forum for the exchange and dissemination of information on marine natural resource issues. These days, innovation in communications is at the heart of GCFI's mission. And increasingly, we're communicating about emerging issues like invasive lionfish, the sargassum influx, and now stony coral tissue loss disease. The GCFI couldn't do what we do without our partners. Although 2020 hasn't been a regular year for anyone, 
GCFI is fortunate to have strong partnerships that have ensured continuity in our work this year. Among them are our valued partners at NOAA, and we're honoured this morning to have a keynote by NOAA's Deputy Administrator that's so relevant and up to the minute in applying science, technology, cooperation and communications to save coral reefs. So please enjoy the keynote. Please stay on afterwards for our annual membership meeting where you can learn more about GCFI's work and participate in our future directions. Martin and I have been fortunate to count on the excellent support and participation of the board of directors and the officers of GCFI this year. So thank you so much to the board and officers for organising this virtual GCFI 73. And thank you to our trusted translators who are with us as always. There are 12 committees working hard behind the scenes to ensure that GCFI performs as a well-recognised NGO re in the region. We have student involvement in many aspects of GCFI. And this year, we have a really high level of interest in new members joining the GCFI board, which I think bodes really well for our future. So thank you from both Martin and I for giving us the privilege to be chair and vice chair for the past three years. And thank you to all of you for being part of GCFI's network. Thanks. And thank you, Emma. And now we would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Rear Admiral Tim Gallivet, who is the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and also the Deputy Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, commonly known as NOAA. From 2017 to 2019, he served as the Acting Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and NOAA Administrator. Before these assignments, he served for 32 years in the US Navy, completing his service in 2017 as the Oceanographer of the Navy. In his current position, Rear Admiral Gallaudet leads NOAA's Blue Economy activities that advance marine transportation, sustainable seafood, ocean exploration and mapping, marine tourism and recreation, and coastal resilience. Rear Admiral Gallaudet has a bachelor's degree from the U.S. Naval Academy and a master's and doctorate degree from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, all of these in oceanography. We are truly honored to have the Rear Admiral speak today about NOAA's strategy to respond to and prevent the spread of stony coral tissue loss disease. During the keynote, please use the question and answer box to enter your questions. These are going to be addressed after the, after the keynote presentation. And so please let us all welcome Rear Admiral Gallaudet to deliver our opening keynote. Thank you so much, Fidela. And um, hello, everybody, and hola y buenos dias. It is just great to be here at this 73rd annual conference of the GCFI. And I'm, I'm really proud of our NOAA team that have uh, partnered so well with GCFI and uh, MPA Connect to uh, hold this event and support all the activities that GCFI promotes. Uh, I'm really am proud of our Coral Reef Conservation Program under the incredible leadership of Jennifer Cost, celebrating the 20th anniversary and so this, this, uh, this presentation I'm giving is really a kind of a milestone in, in that uh, 20 years of great accomplishment. And what I'd like to point out, which is a neat way to start this, is that that program, our, our Coral Reef Conservation Program, um, annually announces our co Coral Reef Heroes. And just this September, GCFI was recognized as one of those Coral Reef Heroes for all that you've done to champion the conservation of coral reef ecosystems in the Gulf and the Caribbean. So good on you, GCFI. Uh, proud to be serving with a coral hero as, as, as you. Now, um, I, I also I want to acknowledge the loss of Leroy Cresswell. Uh, Noah um, benefited from his uh, terrific work and advocacy, and, and so we all we share that sense of loss and know that uh, we're we're we we're, renewed our commitment to uh, advance marine uh, resources, protected areas, and coral conservation in the in the way that Leroy would have wanted, and that's that's what this presentation uh, represents. And so um, as, I, as I go through this, you know, NOAA has a kind of wide portfolio, so I'll talk a little bit about what we do in general, and then I'll neck down on this very specific issue of stony coral tissue loss disease. But before I start, let me just recognize again Bob Glazer. Thank you for that great introduction. 
Um, I think fun and free are good. So uh, kudos to you for the, the, the new format of this conference. And uh, Emma, thank you. Uh, you're the MPA Connect coordinator and I appreciate that kind uh, reference to my talk here and my service here at NOAA. I'm very proud of our agency and it's just an honor to represent us here in this venue. And I'd also like to recognize Dr. Graciela Garcia Molinaire. Uh, you're uh, uh, both um, a GCFI board member and uh, you've been working with us at NOAA and also the Caribbean Fishery Management Council for 25 years. I've not met you in person, Graciela, but I look forward to when I can someday. And then I also on, on my NOAA team, we've had some people that really have just done all the hard work behind this, and that's Dana Wusunich Mendez of our Coral Reef Conservation Program, as well as Dr. Lexa Skravanek, who authored this Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease Strategy uh, during her one year time as a, as a Canals Fellow with us. So really proud of their contributions. They're, they're really the, the brains behind the operation. So uh, there's an interesting thing here as, a, as I understand the theme here of the conference is stories from the field. And so I'll share with you this title slide, this image right here is a story from the field. I'm in the middle there and I'm sandwiched between uh, Dr. Matt Perry and Dr. Shannon Roosborn out in Pacific on a, on a, on a coral uh, nursery. And I, I use that photo to introduce uh, this talk because of the, you know, we're so centered on preventing the spread of stony coral tissue loss disease into the Pacific. And that, I took that away when I chaired the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force meeting uh, last year in Palau. And, uh, and that, that was really the, the, the main effort of, of our discussions is ensuring we contain this really you know, harmful uh, phenomena. And so that's what we're talking about here. And that's what I'm going to talk about. But before I do, let me just provide a little context. So if, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, I want to share with you a bit about NOAA's kind of overarching priorities. And, uh, and so we have really three. And, and they all actually support coral conservation to some degree. Uh, our weather model priority is about improving our weather prediction and really regaining number one position in our global weather modeling. And uh, if you look at the hurricane season this year, especially with respect to the Gulf, it's been historic. And the accuracy of our weather model predictions, it, you know, has really been on uh, on center stage. And we perform very well, making very accurate predictions. For example, with Hurricane Laura, we predicted that landfall three days in advance to within less than a mile error. Uh, and that, that, that ensures state evacuations of many and, uh, and rapid response afterwards. So we're really proud of that. That affects uh, livelihoods and economies around the Gulf and the Caribbean in such an important way. The other uh, uh, priority area we have is our blue economy priority. And, and what we're talking about there is, is what we're here for. It's uh, tourism and recreation and, and the coral reef conservation that supports it. It's uh, map, mapping and marine transportation, so making our nautical charts. It also includes things like our, our, our fisheries, sustainable fisheries, which GCFI does so much to promote, as well as a really cool area called ocean exploration, where we use deep diving ROVs and AUVs to explore and, 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 and characterize the ocean, uh, which so much of which is still unknown. And then, uh, and then coastal resilience, which I know the Gulf and Caribbean communities really understand. And, uh, and that's, that's uh, you know, an area that coral reefs contribute in a big way. And lastly, we have a space innovation priority, and that's just about using our 18 weather satellites in important ways to support the other two priorities. And, uh, and, and we, we actually, one program that, that is, uh, benefits from that is our, our Coral Reef Watch program run of our, out of our NOAA Environmental Satellite and Data Information Service, using satellite data to predict the, uh, um, the viability of coral reefs depending on bleaching events and other risks and hazards. So those are the big priorities. Next slide, please. Uh, on our blue economy priority, uh, there are two parts I mentioned that coral reefs contribute to in a really significant way, and that's that's tourism and recreation. And I, I know this firsthand because I have dove, I have been to the Caribbean dozens of times for the sole purpose to scuba dive on coral reefs. And I, in fact, my family's joined me. We're all scuba divers. We have benefited by that, as well as the uh, the, the the Florida Keys. And so I have a real personal interest uh, in, in this, this topic. And then, the, then the, the coastal resilience piece is that, you know, reefs present, uh, prevent inundation and absorb about 97% of wave energy coming from offshore. So really vital as we talk about the threats of sea level rise and increasing frequency and, and intensity of storms, you know, coral reefs are really front and center in protecting our coastal communities with big economic impacts. I mean, when you look at the economic impact of, of coral restoration 
and our coral reefs, it, it's on the order of a billion dollars in the U.S. And that is, that's a remarkable figure. So that's, that's really why there's just so many uh, people in the country can get behind this important area. And, uh, and that's why we've, we've focused on this new strategy. So uh, next slide, please. Now, underpinning these priorities, we've been advancing in several science and technology areas you see depicted here. And, um, and there's six of them. And they're areas that I think many of the scientists in our audience are very familiar with. Autonomous systems or drones, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, an area called omics, which includes bioinformatics and environmental DNA, and, uh, and data, like big data analytics, cloud services, and citizen science or crowdsourcing. We uh, articulated these strategies, uh, with, which outline goals and objectives for each, because they're all cross-cutting among every mission area. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're applying some of these to coral reef restoration and stony coral tissue loss disease specifically. Um, but the neat thing about, about these is they, they're being applied not just to coral reefs, for example, but we're applying to fisheries management. We're applying these technology areas to weather modeling and forecasting and really just about every NOAA mission area. So they're very transformative and, uh, and we're excited about the potential that science and technology has to not only improve improve our performance, but also our efficiency. And, uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to these in the future. Now that's, that's the, I'm like, that's the scene setter there, the big picture. But let's go on and talk about what NOAA does uh, in, in the area of coral reefs. Next slide, please. Right, so our coral reef conservation program, as I mentioned, under the leadership of Jennifer Koss, just does so much good. I mean, just this year, we announced 10.5 million in federal funds distributed over 28 different uh, recipients to uh, support coral rest restoration, the science behind it, and uh, and um, conservation. So that's just a great program. We do this every year with partners, and uh, and, and I'm just very proud of our 20th anniversary to announce it. Uh, and there's some other activities that this office oversees. You know, for example, uh, we we you see in the middle there a picture of this um, of this manager's guide for coral restoration planning and design. And uh, and that was a uh, you know this is an effort of a of an interagency partnership between NOAA, EPA, as well as the Nature Conservancy, just to help uh, coral reef managers you know, know where to go when they begin restoration work. So a really important document there that helps helps the community uh, move forward. And certainly in, in times that are really needed. Uh, I, I actually was able to go to the Caribbean, for example, uh, Culebra Island in uh, Puerto Rico, and see some of the damage from uh, Hurricane Maria that caused the, the reefs out there. And so, you know, this, 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 this guide is important for that. It's important, of course, for this stony coral tissue loss disease and other threats facing reefs. And then I'm also proud of the grants program uh, of our, uh, our, pardon me, of our coral reef conservation program, specifically the new grant program we've established to honor Ruth Gates. And this is the Ruth Gates Coral Restoration Innovation Grants. And uh, we're really, you know, proud to, to carry her legacy forward. She did so much for the community and was just the pioneer that laid the foundation that all we uh, that we now have built upon. And um, and so we think this is just a fitting way to honor her. And uh, and we ne we started this last year, and we have a one million dollar in funding for projects uh, this year. And it was all started by a National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine study on intervention to increase the resilience of coral reefs. So we actually took that and we have developed an action plan for coral intervention in response to that study. Now, if you go to the next slide, please. Some more work uh, that our Coral Reef Conservation Program does, and it's, it's partnerships. It's partnerships with GCFI, which is, a, a, you know, we're, we're so connected. I know we have uh, members on the board of directors we have, as I mentioned, and I know our, our own Bill Michaels has been a, a, a leader yeah, and contributing to uh, the great work of GCFI. And, uh, and, and, and GCFI is a convener in holding these conferences and other events to bring the community together and exchange information and advance capability and capacity. It's just a, a, a wonderful thing. Now, also, I want to give a shout out to MPA Connect and Emma uh, for joining us here and supporting this, this great event. MPA Connect is uh, really kind of a marvel to me, representing 32 marine protected areas from 11 countries and ter territories across the Caribbean. As I said, I've dove in most of those, and, uh, and I, I'm just delighted in being able to see the beautiful uh, marine life uh, that these MPAs have uh, uh, promoted and supported and conserved. So just a great organization doing so much good. We're just proud to partner with MPA Connect. And then also, 
I should probably talk a little bit about uh, the fact that um, the, the MPAs that we're seeing here, uh, the, the MPA Connect supports and advances, um, the, 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 they, they do um, work that we're working to replicate uh, in other areas. And in fact, uh, we'll be making an announcement regarding some MPAs in the Pacific using MPA Connect as a, as a model um, in the near future. So stay tuned to that. Now, if you could go to the next slide, please. Another area that our coral reef conservation program promotes are some very specific projects and, and reports. And you see on the left here of the slide, uh, the, we, we annually produce these coral reef status reports, uh, which, are, which are really important for just documenting the state of our coral reefs around the different uh, jurisdictions and territories of, of, of the U.S. And, uh, and the freely associated states. Uh, so, we, so we have a baseline. We know where to go. And that's, this is the springboard on which to launch our various activities to restore, intervene, and, uh, and conserve our reef systems. And, um, and then we have a very specific and important project regarding our Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, who, who have launched this Mission Iconics Reef, Iconic Reefs effort, thank you, uh, in, in these, these seven uh, really, really important iconic reefs to, uh, to restore them as well uh, under the threat of, of the, all the challenges I mentioned. So that's just a terrific effort too. And it really was sort of a impetus for me to come up with an idea to, to develop a stony coral tissue loss disease strategy, as I mentioned, uh, during the Coral Reef Task Force meeting in Palau. Okay, that's a lot of background and info, but, uh, but important to know, because uh, those are the tools in the toolbox. And let's talk now specifically about you know, the focus of our talk, and that's stony coral tissue loss disease. So next slide, please. Right, now everybody here in the audience, I think is well familiar with this, this scourge, if you will. Uh, this, you know, it, it, we're seeing all of the Atlantic, and, uh, uh, South Atlantic and Caribbean reef systems affected, uh, certainly in, in uh, Florida. And, um, and, you know, we have a, a, not just our kind of primary coral reef species, uh, but also several that are listed under the Dangerous Species Act. So they're, we're seeing just a really significant amount of impact. And um, a little bit about the disease, just for those who maybe aren't familiar and haven't kept as much uh, you know, into the science as, as NOAA has. Um, this, this disease was first reported in 2014. I mean, that, that's incredible when you think how rapid the spread has been. And now it's affected, it's affected all 360 miles of, the coral, of Florida's coral reef system. And the only area that hasn't, we haven't seen it yet in is the dry tortugas. Um, so that's just, you know, the incredible rate of the spread is just unbelievable. The Caribbean just began seeing it in 2018. And, uh, and now, you know, we're seeing it, it's been seen in 16 different Caribbean countries and territories, including the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So this is just a really a remarkable um, spread and, and change in our, our ecosystems in the region. And that's why, that's why we're jumping on this with, with this strategy is we know crisis demands urgency and response. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, a little bit about, about this phenomena. It's, um, it, it is really hard to diagnose, you know, and, and I actually, I have, I think I've seen it, but I wasn't sure I have because it, it sort of has other characteristics that overlap with other different diseases like, like white plague. And so um, it's, it's hard to characterize it first. And that's a challenge. You know, detection is really important, early detection in terms of intervention. And so, so that's one of them. And um, we know that several species have been served as like indicators for this. Maize coral is one and pillar co coral is another that seem to be uh, you know, particularly affected by these. And, um, and those are important because of the fact that they just, they're the sort of build reef frameworks, if you will. Um, it's also very uh, interesting in that the, um, the numbers are, are significant. I think from what I understand, you know, in any given reef system not affected by this, uh, disease rate prevalence is something on the order of two to three percent. And when stony coral tissue loss disease is seen, we see something on the order of 66 to 100 percent of the susceptible species affected. That's remarkable, and that is really something to take heed on, and, uh, and therefore, you know, why we're making this the main effort of this presentation. And you know, it, it, it persists for years, uh, and, and that uh, just in the Florida Upper Keys, since 2014, uh, we have seen a 40 percent loss in coral cover. I mean, that, that is tragic. And so uh, we really, I think this is why GCFI as a convener um, is so important in this to, to get everybody together because this has to be a team effort. No one agency or organization can do it alone. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? Right, okay, a couple other things about this. Uh, first off, 
um, I'm proud of the fact that Florida had really took this on seriously. And so with NOAA, with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, as well as the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and the National Park Service, we've all gotten together with and EPA as well for, um, to, uh, to, you know, to, to address this issue, to study it, and, and really just, to, as I mentioned, build a, a, a team uh, to, to get at this. And so I, you know, that, that's been a really great model that now the Caribbean has, has taken on. And I, I know that uh, Florida, for example, um, they've been sort of the model that the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico has taken in their response plans. And, uh, and so um, uh, they're, uh, uh, just, I have to say, just a lot of people behind this, 60 different organizations, and uh, very exciting to see. What's also really exciting to see is the opportunities for partnerships. And I include here a, a picture of, um, uh, or the logos of Force Blue. This is a neat, uh, a neat organization. They're comprised of former Special Forces divers, Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, Air Force pararescue individuals, and, um, and they've been very uh, active in restoring reefs that are affected by this tissue loss disease. And, uh, and they have launched a new 100 Yards of Hope uh, a campaign, and it's, uh, it's, it's focused on Florida, and, and with the uh, Super Bowl in Miami this year and next year in Tampa Bay, they're, they're using the Super Bowl as an event to promote uh, uh, the awareness of this issue and to secure greater partnerships. So that's a, a pretty exciting development as a public-private partnership, and, and we're really uh, pleased to see that. And Jim Ritterhoff is the director of this great group, and I couldn't say enough good things about him and his team. I also worked for two years at the Navy SEAL headquarters, so I really identify uh, with the, these folks because part of their campaign is not just to restore reefs, it's also to deal with the post-traumatic stress syndrome that so many of the veterans are experiencing and by coral restoration activity, it's a sort of therapy for them and it's just really a, a wonderful win-win um, kind of thing. Now, um, a, a couple other things about these partnerships activities is um, we are working with the Association of uh, Zoos and Aquariums to uh, uh, identify coral species and preserve their genetic uh, material um, in, in the event that we see any losses in the wild. So for example, I've been to the National Aquarium where we are growing and, um, and, and uh, we are growing various different types of species of coral and that's happening in other aquaria too uh, for the means of preserving you know, the genetic information of these species so that, you know, in the event that we can go and take that and once we get a better handle on the disease, repopulate them uh, in, in the wild. So it's a really terrific effort and uh, applying some really excellent uh, R&D and science and technology. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and a little bit more about our partnership here with GCFI. Um, this, is a, this is a really terrific um, um, slide and picture. Uh, because what we have here is a group, the Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment uh, Group, and this is under the Caribbean Cooperation Team, uh, which facilitates communication with international partners about stony coral tissue loss disease. So it's just a neat uh, team effort here. Again, it's kind of a common theme um, with all this. And, that, and what you see also is a depiction of the Caribbean Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease Dashboard uh, to help coral reef managers monitor the status and spread of the disease around the Atlantic and Gulf. So it's a, it's a good, it's a really important team effort. And, um, and, and this, this group also promotes training and, uh, and, and, and resources for detection and response in the Caribbean. A really, uh, you know, great thing. And MPA Connect is also a part of this. So uh, uh, also, you know, Emma, thank you again for your support. And um, I, I've just enjoyed uh, watching this from afar um, and, and, and looking forward to when I can dive in the Caribbean again and, uh, and see all that work firsthand. Okay, a little scene set of there with our coral work. Let's talk about this new strategy then. Next slide, please. Okay, now uh, what, I'm, what we're gonna talk about is you know, the, our specific plant strategy here to prevent the spread of the Pacific as well as respond to the disease and, um, and contain it. Now, uh, it, we have eight goals under the strategy, and for, just for those who maybe uh, are not initiated, strategies are basically, you know, they identify goals and objectives, where we want to go and why. And you probably, the other, you know, after you develop a strategy, it's typical that you'll develop a plan, an implementation plan, a strategic plan, a roadmap, and those tell you how, when, and by who. 
And so here we are, we're not giving a plan yet, we're just giving the main goals and objectives of how we want to contain this disease. And so we've broken these eight goals into kind of three big areas, research, response, and engagement with partners. And, and so the, the goals are listed here. I'll talk a little bit about each one. And what you can kind of get a, a kind of a picture about is that starting with research, the activities and impact just begin to expand kind of dramatically. And it's the engagement with partners. All of you in the room at GCFI and others, uh, this is, you know, you're a part of this, this solution. And, uh, and we're very excited to you know, have this and announce it uh, here at the conference. So, uh, go, and by the way, um, you know, uh, this, the idea of a strategy, this is a NOAA strategy. We've not yet developed the national strategy. That's a great next step. But uh, the purpose behind this and those S&T strategies I talked about uh, is that, you know, NOAA, had, like any big agency in the government, we have a lot of offices. And in fact, just for coral, we have our fisheries habitat office. We have in the Ocean Service, the Coral Reef Conservation Program. We have in the Ocean Service our, our coastal uh, ocean science centers. And you know, um, all, all of them are doing great work. And the idea was let's coordinate the activity better and, and collaborate and ensure we're all singing from the same sheet of music. So that was the intent here, was coordinate NOAA's activities across all the various offices. And I didn't even name the half dozen other offices that support this work. So that's what this strategy does. It gets all of us on the same page and uh, we're pretty excited about it. So go ahead, next slide, please. So the first one's about research, and there's just a whole lot of potential here. Uh, there's great re research going on, and we want to advance it. And uh, just you know, kind of a couple things to talk, talk about here. It's it's research and data collection. That's what the school is seeking to uh, move forward on, and um, and it just involves a wide range of activities. For example, uh, we're working uh, we're working with EPA and NRL, uh, at, at, you know, in one case to research potential vectors for transmission. And we're still not sure about the link to shipping activity in ballast water. And that's you know, just the main area of research is to determine that. Because if we can pinpoint that as a, as a cause or a source, then we'll, we'll be able to better um, you know, contain it by through regulation and, and specifically target you know, where it's happening and when. And, and that's, that, so that's, that's just the main effort right now. We just don't know so much about that. Uh, there's other things like antibiotic treatments, which is really interesting and there's some heavy lifting there too so we're we're looking at potentially using autonomous systems or drones for example to do some of this and um, and, and the like you know uh, advancing our coral reef monitoring program uh, like coral reef watch and and, uh, and and the coral reef monitoring program under nova c coral reef conservation program that's that's a, another effort and that's led by the the you know, remarkable and capable dr erica toll who i i've served with for some time and greatly admire, and, uh, and some other things. There's things like coral disease etiology, intervention, mitigation research, and, and others. And uh, again, again, all this with partners. Again, common theme, uh, using the team. And we have folks, for example, in the Florida Coral Disease Response uh, effort, and that's organized under, includes Florida as well as the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. And um, another area on this, which I think is fascinating, is we still have not wired the case definition. So we're trying to refine that so we can really understand and characterize the care, you know, what, what, what is happening whenever we see a certain instance of this disease. It's not fully physically and physiologically characterized, which I find amazing. But when you think about the rapid spread, it's just, there's a lot to do. So this research priority, you know, it contains quite a bit and, and it's important. And, um, and we have many offices within NOAA and partners that are, are seeking to advance it. Um, I think one other area too is transmission experiments. So a focus of this is to prevent the spread of the Pacific. So conducting transmission experiments is going to be you know, critical to better preventing that. Okay, that's our research goal. We have several others. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, building response capacity. This specifically is about the capacity for coral disease detection, prevention, and intervention. So th there's, you know, there's, a, there's a couple things here. And capacity is about you know, uh, building our infrastructure and our capabilities and, uh, and our resources, um, as well as uh, working with partners to do it, because we just always will never have all the resources we need. And so uh, some of the activity there is, is conducting exchange with our MPA partners in the Atlantic and Pacific. And, and supporting workshops to you know uh, that will help increase capacity for detection and monitoring. 
Uh, other things that I think are really interesting and, and we've, we've already started is uh, dive gear decontamination protocols, which is really interesting. I know that the National Marine Sanctuary in American Samoa has already begun those. And whenever someone visits right now, they, they institute those kind of decontamination protocols. And that's just really an example of what to do more of everywhere. Uh, to ensure and you know, we don't spread this disease. There's um, surveillance protocols we're working on, so that's another area. And um, I think one, uh, one of the science and technology er strategies I mentioned really has an opportunity here, and that's citizen science-based efforts to increase the monitoring. Because think, just think about this. Everybody on the reef can be a sensor and an observer reporting the spread of this disease. And everybody who does that has access to a device and can instantly upload that information you know, onto a, a network. So that's, there's real potential there. Um, and I, I'll also mention that um, I'm really, uh, one of our great teammates at the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, Dr. Andy Bruckner, he's developed disease ID cards. And, uh, and so these are to help both, uh, both managers as well as, as I mentioned, dive operators, citizens, you know, being able to identify where the disease is and when. Uh, because when you think how fast it is, we just really, capacity is, is just, is really necessary. Okay, we have a couple other goals. Let's go to goal three, coral rescue. So this is talking about rescue, propagation, and restoration operations, as, as well as research and partnerships to support that. And as I mentioned, preserving the genetic diversity of corals uh, that, that the American uh, Zoo, Association of Zoos and Aquariums is, is promoting. So that's, um, that's a really interesting area too, um, in, in the area of fisheries and the strategy I called omics, uh, preserving genetic diversity and also providing broodstock for future generation uh, restoration efforts is, is what this is about. And so we're doing some of this now and we're working to do a lot more of it. Um, some of the things under this school include identifying resources and personnel for long-term storage and, and the infrastructure needed for that. Um, uh, we have some of that going on at our Hollings lab, for example. And uh, at, under uh, under NOAA's uh, uh, centers for uh, coastal and ocean science, and, and we're, we just we need to, we need more, and and that's going to be through partnerships with the state of Florida, the, our Caribbean partners, and others. Now let's see here. Let's go to goal four, please. And promoting awareness has got to be one of the most important uh, engagement activities because. This is about getting public interest in this. I think when you go to coastal communities in Florida, we have that to some extent, but we, we could do more. And I think, I think the, the extent to which we can do this at a national level uh, would even be greater. And making you know, the value of coral reef systems, and certainly ours in Florida, as well as our, our territories in the Caribbean and our partners, bringing that to the national level, making people in the middle of America care about this, there, that therein is the opportunity, because I mean now, now that the oceans are, have become you know increasingly popular as well as conservation, uh, I think I think th there is potential here, and and so this is certainly what a, a, a purpose of this goal is is to make the American public aware of this and want to support it, and and that's going to help us bring home the, the resources we'll need. Um, and so let's see, I think that's um that's the that's goal four awareness. Let's go to goal five. Next slide. All right, now working with coral reef managers. I talked about all the work we currently do. Um, there's, there's more work to do though. And I think this is in the area of, of multi-sector partnerships. So of course we have fisheries folks, uh, fisheries managers, fisheries scientists, uh, because coral reefs are the nurseries of our fisheries. We have uh, tourism and recreation industry, so dive charter operators or recreational fishermen. We have uh, the managers, of course, uh, coral reef managers uh, and folks from like my agency and, and Florida's um, Fish and Wildlife Service and, and the like. So we getting more of, of the other sectors into the game, uh, I think, is where the opportunity lies here. Because uh, all of them can then now support coral reef managers and, and to help them reduce the stressors on coral reefs. So um, and let me give you one really neat example. When I went to the island of Calabria uh, last year, um, I, I saw firsthand how this, like, what this goal was like in action, uh, and what we, what we were doing was we were working. Our habitat office, our conservation office, was working with um, the Florida, or pardon me, the Puerto Rico Department of Natural Resources to stabilize the roads on the island. And what that means is most of the roads were dirt roads beforehand, and whenever it rained, they would just be rivers of mud 
and all that mud and, and, and silt would go in to the coast and, and basically kill the coral, coral reef systems offshore. But by, by providing road stabilization, gravel and different other types of environmental engineering to keep the mud from flowing into the, the, the coast of the coastal waters, the reefs now have begun thriving. So that's just one example of reducing stressors on coral reefs and having coral reef managers work with other sectors to, uh, you know, to get, at, get at the problem. So reducing the stressors on coral reefs is really what this is about and working with other, other sectors to do it. So a good example there, we wanna replicate that as widely and as far as we can. Okay, next slide, please. All right, now fisheries management. They're also key players here. And, and there's a very you know, specific uh, uh, action here we're trying to get at. And that is using the essential fish habitat provisions of the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. So that's fisheries managers Bible. And using those, as well as section seven of the Endangered Species Act consultations under that to ensure stony coral tissue loss disease is evaluated as part of the baseline environmental conditions and assessments that those two acts uh, govern. And, and so this, this is, I think, a very powerful goal, and I'm really glad that, that, that our team was bright enough to include it in because these uh, two acts are um, institutionalized in our agency and in, in the environmental community. And by leveraging them and ensuring stony, stony coral tissue loss disease um, prevention and response is factored in to the implementation of these two acts um, is, is a brilliant move and it's gonna provide you know, a lot more power uh, to our overall effect. Uh, so great goal there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and now international partnerships. That's, that's everybody in this room. Uh, and by working together, I, again, as a team in the Caribbean uh, to better detect, to monitor, uh, to intervene, and all the things I mentioned about. Um, and so this is a, this is, I think, a really uh, an admirable goal as well, because uh, uh, I, I, all the preamble I gave you about our work with GCFI, as well as MPA Connect, this is, a, this is basically putting that into action for this specific, um, uh, this specific issue of, of stony coral tissue loss disease. And I think you know that NOAA co-leads this Caribbean cooperation team that I mentioned, and that, that's, that's gonna be the action arm for this goal. Okay, last slide, please. So, as I mentioned, uh, we identified the, the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force, by the way, as a, as a chair of that body, I have to say it's one of the coolest job titles I could ever imagine, chair of the U.S. Coral Reef Task Force. But we identified that, you know, this is, this is important. We do not want this to spread into the Pacific uh, for, for all, the, all the good reasons that you could imagine, but also that the freely associated states in particular, that's Palau, uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands, they're critical partners uh, for the United States in a strategic context. And so helping them preserve their, their fisheries-based economies as well as their, their, their tourism and recreation economies is important for us. It's important, believe it or not, it's a national security priority. So this, this strategy, this coral reef strategy is, is a national security priority uh, because of uh, the partnerships in the region as well as the fact that if you look at the national security strategy of the U.S., and I've not a lot of people in this room probably have, but, but I, I have based on my past life in the Navy. The second pillar of it is promoting prosperity, American prosperity. So that's the economy, and, and again, the economies of our partners. And this is, this is what we're getting at here. So preventing the spread of the Pacific is, is at that level um, of, of significance. So that's important. Uh, and a couple other things that I said, we're really interested on the effect, like what's the source? Is it ballast water? Is it something else? We don't know yet. So really understanding that is gonna help us better refine the actions associated with this goal. Okay, next slide, please. So just to kind of, a, again, going, stepping out a bit and talking about context. Uh, so our coral reef conservation program has a strategic plan. So we didn't write the strategy in a vacuum. We looked at that and made sure that everything in, in our plan was aligned with this specific one. And, uh, and made, making sure there was synergy between the two. And, um, and now we know that the U.S. Virgin Islands has completed a similar response plan, and, uh, and we're looking forward to supporting Puerto Rico and Florida in the development of theirs. Okay, next slide, please. 
Right. I talked about uh, opportunities for science and technology, and, and uh, I, I, there's just so much opportunity here. I point your attention to this Forbes article about using drones and AI uh, in this effort, and there is great potential there. So we're making investments already in the monitoring and detection of stony coral tissue loss disease and just coral conservation in general, um, and, and we're going to be doing much, much more. So uh, I think that therein is where the opportunity is. Uh, and I'm excited to support it going forward. Um, next slide, please. All right. Well, I think as we go forward, uh, really looking forward to uh, working all with you. We are not going to be able to do this without the people in, in, in the room here, the virtual room, and um, again, under the leadership of our Coral Reef Conservation Program. And um, I, you know, I think uh, as, we, as we move forward this year in implementing the strategy, which is that next step, member strategy is sort of uh, where we're going and why, and then we're going to write an implementation plan on how, when, and by who. And, uh, and we'll look forward to all of your support in helping us write that plan. And that's going to guide our actions. And most, you know, we'll probably lay it out as a five-year uh, plan that, that we can measure, you know, measure our progress with. And I think, you know, what, what I would like to be able to do is in a year, uh, talk about, you know, having that plan complete and making the initial actions under it for, for the first year of it. That, that'd be a, that's a real goal, to be able to tell everybody at the, in the meeting next year, in person, we sure hope, uh, that uh, uh, we've made progress and here's how. So that, that's definitely the goal. Uh, okay, uh, last slide, please. All right, well, it is great to be here. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to a few questions. Uh, hopefully I can answer them. Um, but I just want to thank GCFI and MPA, MPA Connect for all you do uh, for our Gulf and Caribbean coral reef systems, for our fisheries, and uh, and for our marine resources, uh, which I you know am just so proud to be able to uh, recognize in this keynote. Um, thank you, and over to you, Fadilla. Thank you, Admiral Gallaudet. Um, we're now going to invite um, our moderator, who will be Dana Lucinich Mendez from NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program, where she's the team lead for the Atlantic and the Caribbean. She's very well known to the GCFI for her role in helping us to coordinate the MPA Connect Network, and she also has an important regional role as co-coordinator of the Caribbean Cooperation Team on Stony Coral Tissue Loss Disease, alongside Judy Lang from AGRA, and now Dana is going to facilitate our Q&A session with the Admiral Gallaudet. So take it away, Dana. Thanks, Fidela. Hi, everyone. Um, Admiral, we've got lots of great questions pouring in here, so I'm going to start to read some of those off to you. Um, we have two that are um, about resources. They're related. So Christine O'Sullivan um, and Sarah Frias Torres want to know, how the strategy will be executed and if there um, is funding and our resources to support the increased effort that the strategy calls for um, in particular you know how some activities in the, in the Caribbean could be supported right so uh, currently we have uh, our, is our coral reef conservation program our fisheries office of habitat restoration and conservation and uh, um, I mentioned our, our NCOS lab, labs, actually, all are working a little bit in this space. So we have program resources already that we're dedicating towards it. Um, the opportunity for more resources. Th therein is the question. Uh, really, that is, that is actually the, one of the purposes of this strategy. So it lays out the big picture, where we want to go and why. We're going to develop a plan. The plan will be resource contingent, of course, uh, but this is the first step. Uh, developing a coherent way ahead that links all the offices within NOAA uh, it, it instills confidence in people who fund us. So we're talking about the White House and gaining interest from the White House. And that's, that's what our next step is, is to brief the Council for Environmental Quality, chaired by uh, Ms. Mary Neumeyer. Um, and and they, in fact, we, I've, had, I've been in her office in the White House. We've had many, many discussions on the oceans. And, uh, and they've made some great strides uh, this last year. You know, we had our first national, new National Marine Sanctuary in 20 years. Uh, that was, a, you know, some great progress. And, um, and so they're showing interest in things like this. So that's the next step. Brief her. And that, that means we have a potential to get more in our budget. And then, of course, once we have a, a 
budget, uh, then we look forward to the Hill, the, the Congress, to appropriate funds. And there's great bipartisan support for this kind of work in the, on the Hill. And so that will be our next step is to brief uh, the various committees like the House Natural Resources Committee, the Senate, uh, Senate Committee on Science and Commerce, and, uh, and appropriations committees uh, on this strategy. And, and so there is the thing is we, we are developing this for that whole purpose is, is hoping to get more resources for us and to share with our, our partners in the Caribbean. Excellent. Okay, Marina Maria Pena wants to know. Um, oh, sorry, my my question answer box is scrolling all by itself. A lot of questions pouring in. Um, Admiral, are Caribbean nations monitoring for stony coral tissue loss disease? Is NOAA interested in what we see? And is there anything else the Caribbean community should be doing and responding to stony coral tissue loss disease? Well, yes, I, I mentioned some of the efforts that are occurring. Um, it, it, so the answer is yes, and yes and yes, actually. And that um, I know that we're, we're working with our Caribbean partners to some extent, and we want to ex expand it. And that, that was one of the goals and the strategy is our international partnerships, strengthening and expanding them. That's exactly right. Uh, so, so we really hope that this venue will be an opportunity to, ex to continue that conversation and even make commitments. And, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to uh, maybe uh, recognizing some of those new commitments by visiting our Caribbean partners as soon as possible. How about that? So yes, thank you. <clears throat> and I'll just add that I shared um, a website in the in the chat with everyone. The Admiral had mentioned earlier that we've um, been working with EGRA and MPA Connect to develop a, a dashboard to track stony coral tissue loss disease. And so the link to AGRA's, the Atlantic Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment, um, to their disease website is in the chat where folks can find that information and that dashboard that the Admiral had mentioned in his presentation. Okay, next question. Sorry for the pause, this uh, an answer box is, is doing its own thing. Okay, so Claire would like to know, how are your teams thinking about engaging public education plans for goal number four, promoting awareness? Well, that's great. Uh, great question. In, uh, our Office of Education and NOAA headquarters uh, leads that kind of outreach, and they have a number of programs to do this and a, a network of partners. We, uh, th that includes, um, golly, uh, just a wide variety of science institutions. We have scholar and intern uh, programs, too. It, throughout NOAA uh, in, in every area, fisheries, weather service, ocean service, that, that's a means of making those connections. And, um, and then, of course, we, we, we fund a, a wide range of activities uh, uh, with grants to uh, uh, promote that kind of education and outreach. And at a high level, uh, we actually have contributed to a national STEM education and outreach uh, strategy that, again, that the office in the White House I mentioned, the Council for Environmental Quality, they, they oversee that, the development of that, we contributed in a big way. And, and so that, that it's, it's some of those efforts. Uh, Dr. Louisa Koch is the, our, our education office director. And, uh, and so we have, we have made sure that she's contributed to this and she'll be the execution agent for a lot of those activities, as well as our, our, the other offices I mentioned who oversee some of this coral reef outreach research and um, restoration work like our coral reef conservation program. Uh, so we, we have a we have a number of players in this area, and um, I don't know if I I, I, sh I should have mentioned to you uh, I I actually have been uh, I think I said this to the National Aquarium in Baltimore to see some of the work they're doing uh, to pr pr promote or preserve the genetic diversity of various uh, Caribbean and uh, uh, Florida corals. Okay, Holden Harris says thank you. Has the National Coral Reef Task Force conducted efforts to develop forecast models for spread coral loss? Oh my goodness, sorry, the chat box just keeps moving on its own that's <laughs> every time anyone comes in. Um, that's a good question, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I think there, that's an area where we really could improve. And it's, uh, we're just now beginning to model the physical oceanography and meteorology of our of our Earth system in a, a, a way that really represents physical reality. And that's by coupling our global and ocean geophysical models. 
and, and that, that's helping us prove our weather forecasting and hurricane forecasting. We've not really, uh, and we're working to do the same for various um, um, ecosystems, various fish stocks, but that, that's a big challenge. And I think that's where we're really working to take these science and technology areas and, and pr to provide the data, data collection capacity and capability to improve what goes into the models and then there is, and improve the models themselves. So ecosystem modeling um, is, is something we're working with across NOAA, or cr working on across NOAA, and, um, and specifically respect to coral reef ecosystems, um, we have more to do. And so I actually see that, that what, um, for what it's worth, my uh, oldest daughter goes to Nova Southeastern, and one of her professor, David Kerstetter, is joining us today. David, thanks for joining us. Uh, but work that you do, uh, David is an incredibly prolific research scientist, and uh, and so I'm just I'm, uh, your work uh, going forward is going to help us um, get at that really important research priority. Okay, Jay Hagler says, "Great presentation, Admiral Gallaudet." When will the strategic plan be available? Diving with a purpose is ready to continue to partner in the National Marine Sanctuaries. Thank you, Jay. You are a fantastic partner, and it's great to have you here. Uh, and we're going to have we're going to roll the strategy out uh, within the next month, and and we're we'll, we'll be we'll be going on a campaign. Uh, we'll share it with partners. We'll be speaking with the White House and the Hill, and uh, and our interagency colleagues as well. And then the plan to implement it, we're hoping to have done, you know, sometime early next year, probably the first quarter. Uh, we'll see. That might be ambitious. But either way, uh, Jay, thanks for being a great partner and supporter. And thanks for all you do to promote diversity uh, and inclusion in the diving community. Okay. Dr. Judy Lang at AGRA asks... Are those scholar and intern programs mentioned under education and outreach open to Caribbean nationals? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know, Judy. I'll have to get back to you. But uh, in the spirit of this strategy and our partnership with GCFI and AGRA, uh, I would think that should be something we would want to pursue if the answer is no. Um, so thank you. We will take that back. I, I appreciate your question. Okay. And Ruth Perry asks, can there be some U.S. Caribbean partnerships formed under the recent U.S. executive orders, such as aquaculture or public-private partnerships, meaning new partnerships or building upon existing partnerships? Hey, Ruth, a good friend here, Dr. Perry. Nice to have you join us. Uh, yes, and what, what Dr. Perry is referring to is uh, we, we actually have made some big ocean advances this year. We uh, the president signed a memorandum to, to advance our ocean mapping of the U.S. exclusive economic zone, and that directly supports coral reef restoration because we have to map and characterize that that type of habitat before we can actually understand, you know, the health of it and uh, what's it what to how to respond to any kind of challenge. Uh, the other advance we made is uh, a seafood executive order. It's actually the executive order to promote uh, American seafood competitiveness and economic growth. And again, I talked about Magnuson Stevens Act and fisheries management. That that healthy coral reefs are an important part of our fisheries, as GCFI well knows. And so this executive order is going to support uh, that. And to answer your question, Ruth, absolutely, I think our partnerships will be key. This really started with another White House effort. We had a, a summit on ocean science and technology partnerships last November. Uh, Ruth was there uh, as a key player and contributor. And, and we've taken that to go forward and announce a number of really important strategic partnerships with the private sector, with philanthropies and uh, academia and the interagency since then for a wide range of ocean health related issues. So uh, answer is yes. How about that, Ruth? Okay, I think we've got most of them. Okay, here's one that's come in in Spanish from Estrella Villamizar. Um, what has been the the goal of investigating um, coral reefs with drones? Right. So thank you for your question. Uh, muchas gracias. Uh, I think that uh, the idea with drones, we have used aerial drones uh, in areas where the water is clear to map coral coral distribution 
and, and specifically distribution of various species. And we've applied that drone data and we've processed it with machine learning algorithms in an effort to uh, you know, ba provide baseline information on the distribution of various species. Uh, so that, that's, that's sort of like before we can even move forward in response or intervention uh, we, we ha or even undertake any kind of conservation effort, you just have to know what's there and where. And that's what the drone data allows us to do, is to map what's there and where. Great. Um, I don't see any more questions coming in, but Jennifer Koss, the director of the CORAL program, wants us to remind folks that there is a NOAA GCFI manual, about 10 years old now maybe, on appropriately siting aquaculture near reefs. Very good. All right. That addresses the aquaculture effort in our the, the seafood executive order that I mentioned. Thanks, Jennifer. Oh, one more question just came in, Admiral. Sure. Um, thank you for your presentation, Admiral Gallaudet. I would like to know more about citizen science programs as an engagement strategy that could be developed in other Caribbean countries. Are there any NOAA sources or citizen science programs that could be adapted by other NGOs in the Caribbean? There sure are. Uh, the, we, ha we have developed a, a draft, NOAA Citizen Science Strategy, and it's a nice resource. Uh, you can Google that on the, and, and see it on the web. And it kind of summarizes in a really brief and tight way all that we, what we have currently in place and where we want to take it. And, and the answer is we're doing using citizen science in every mission area. We have a very well-established citizen science effort for weather observing. Every, all 102 weather offices under NOAA have a very robust uh, cooperative observer program where they issue the, the, the meteorological sensors to private citizens. And some of these folks have been making routine observations on their homes for decades. And that, that's like one example. We, we have um, a number of others. Uh, we, have, we have fishery science uh, type of uh, uh, crowdsourcing efforts, if you will, uh, for marine mammal uh, sightings and things. And uh, it's very extensive. I think um, we can send you our points of contact who are developing that strategy, and they can share with you the, the wide range of, of those activities. And we would welcome working with Caribbean partners to share what we do in an effort to have them um, replicate them uh, wherever they are. Great. Um, so that's all I have in the Q&A box. Lexa, have you gotten any questions in the chat box? And not that weren't also entered in the Q&A box. So all clear so far in the chat. Thank you, Dana. Okay, any final questions? Oh, one more just popped in. Alfonso Aguilar Pereira says, great presentation. Are there plans to engage coral reefs in MPAs in the southern Gulf of Mexico into an international program for stony coral tissue loss disease? Right, that's a good question. You know, uh, I think that's, we have international partnerships as a, a goal area, one of the goals in this strategy. And I think you know, that, that there's opportunity there, and we sure, certainly should uh, look at that. So I think we, we again, have not specified directly um, the, the what, the when and how of, of, of how we're going to implement this. And so that's what will welcome, you know, some um, contributions from our partners and ideas on how to, how to action this strategy. So like that idea, and we'll certainly consider it. Looks like um, maybe a question just popped up in the chat that I had missed in the Q&A box from Linda Clark. Um, wondering if resources will be allocated to find the pathogen and the vector. What is the status of this testing? And given all the diseased corals that can be tested, what are the barriers to getting real answers? That's a very good question, Linda. Uh, you know, I think I, I can't, there's a lot of science there that I'm a few levels above, not, not, not that, so I don't have a, I, I'm not doing that day to day, uh, but I know we have a team addressing that. Uh, so, you know, I think, I know that, that our, um, uh, our NCOS lab, Cheryl uh, Word, Wordley is, uh, is, is looking exactly that. I've seen some of her facilities and, uh, and her experiments. 
And I, I would I would answer your question by saying, you know, putting you in touch with the scientists who are carrying out these experiments on a daily basis. Okay. Um, that is all I see in the question box. We do have another question in the chat from Bob Glazer. Will any research or funding priorities change? Should there be a change in administration tomorrow? Yeah, Bob, that, that's a great question. Thank you, Lexa, and thank you, Dana. Uh, that's, that remains to be seen. You know, tomorrow will be a big day for our country. And, um, but I don't know, it's, it's a good question. And, and to be absolutely honest with you, uh, so we developed this strategy and, and uh, intend to conduct a, implement a plan in a way that we felt was independent of that, of that question, if you will, of what happens tomorrow. Uh, because this is something I think, again, is bipartisan, and it, it is important for so many reasons. I mean, it's important from the resilience, the coast, coastal resilience standpoint. Um, it's important from just conservation. It's important for our fisheries. I think I laid that all out. And all of those have bipartisan support. So it is, it is certainly our intent. And, uh, and so, and, and I, you know, that, that this, this is carried on throughout whatever administration is, uh, is leading the government uh, in next year. And, uh, and I think, I think I really, I'm pretty confident that will be the case. Okay, Terry, question in from Terry Donaldson from Guam. He says, seagoing oil and glass pl gas platforms transfer Indo-Pacific reef fishes from the Coral Triangle to Trinidad and the Caribbean. Is NOAA looking at the transmission of the disease in reverse? Well, that's a good question, Terry. And I've, I've been diving in Guam uh, in my past life in the Navy, so I could see your interest. Absolutely. I, I enjoyed it greatly. And I, I, don't know, I don't know if we are, but we should. And you can see from the framework of the strategy that is, is this something we will look at if we're not already. Okay. Holden Harris, thank you, Admiral. As a follow-up to asking about ecosystem forecasting spread, will there be efforts to anticipate the enormous economic impacts from SCTLD? I would hope that could help get bipartisan support from those on the Hill. Yes, Holden, that's a good question too, and the answer is definitely. In fact, we, we have in place already a, a few things to do that, if you will. Um, we have, a, for example, a NOAA established something called a Ocean Economy Satellite Account last year. And what that basically is, is it's, a, it's an account that's gonna fund these environmental valuation studies of a wide range of our activities. You know, we, we have a, under this blue economy priority, one of the things we want to do is, we're doing is developing a blue economy strategic plan. And, uh, and it's walking out five years of all these things. We're working to take NOAA's data and information and services to grow uh, the, the ocean and Great Lakes based economy. And so um, valuing impacts like, like of this is something we are going to do. Uh, for example, we have already done that with uh, marine debris or marine litter. In fact, um, we did a study on about four areas around the country. And, if, and we look at the difference between if we never cleaned up marine debris and if we and if we saw a doubling of marine debris, basically no marine debris and two times as much, and we looked at the value of local economies depending upon whether their beaches and coasts were trashed, and you know, we saw values annually of hundreds of millions of dollars and, and thousands of jobs, recreation and tourism jobs. So this is a, we know, and, and we know it's gonna be the same for uh, this stony coral tissue loss disease, and, and we will absolutely work to value that an economic impact for the good reason you mentioned and that this will, I think, be, that'll, that'll really convince those who work our budget uh, and those who appropriate our funds to uh, want to get behind us. Okay. You have time for one more question, Admiral? I do. Okay. Jonathan Joseph wants to know that um, artisanal fishermen in small island development states are showing increased concern in fighting against coral loss and disease, but they lack the information from local governing organizations 
or they lack technical proficiency. From an official standpoint, what would be the best way to disseminate information to these fishermen to engage in the fight against coral loss due to stony coral tissue loss disease? All right, that's a great question. And uh, I will answer it by saying, doing events like this, you know, this is a, the GCFI are connected to fishermen and fishers. And so that's, a, that's the idea is getting this out there now and using the great convening power of GCFI and our partners with, at MPA Connect and other international linkages we have with our Caribbean partners in, in other, other offices at NOAA. So um, that, that's what, and as, as you saw, one of the goals in the strategy is that strengthen and expand international partnerships for that purpose. So having our partners identify that need of, of communicating to artisanal fishermen uh, will help us then target, better target our partnering efforts uh, going forward. So thanks. Okay, that's it from the question and answer box. Well done, Dana, thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Dana, and thank, thank you, everyone. Admiral. Um, so yes, thank you everyone for all the great questions and all the great discussions and especially thank you to the Admiral Gallaudet for such a wonderful presentation. And really it has been an enlightening discussion. I saw that there was a lot of exchange about um, the strategies and sharing information. And we are really truly honored to have you speak about NOAA's strategy for stony coral tissue loss disease. And it's really a pressing issue right now, especially in this region and it's affecting many of our precious coral reefs, which uh, many um, countries are dependent on. So we thank you once again. So this wraps up the um, official um, end of our keynote presentation. So I think we'll all in the audience um, thank the Admiral again for sharing um, with us today. So thank you once again, and we encourage everyone to please stick around. This isn't the end of this morning's session, um, but it is an end to our keynote. And thank you again to our moderator, Dana Musinich mendez again for helping out today and helping to drive the conversation. So thank you again to the Admiral, to the audience, and for everyone who's joining. And please do stick around as we're going to continue on with the rest of our um, program for this morning. Great, thanks for having me. So next I would like to invite um, our executive director, Bob Glazer, to join us on screen um, to move on to wrapping up our GCFI 73 opening ceremony. So Bob, um, can you join us on screen, please? Here I am. Oh. Well, I want to personally thank Admiral Gallaudet for a very interesting, compelling, and hopeful presentation. I know a lot of us the, uh, live in the tropics down here in the Caribbean, and for me, the Florida Keys, are very worried about this um, disease. Uh, it could change the whole landscape or seascape that we live in. And so there's, some, there's a lot of hope there and a lot of, um, a lot of good minds that are being um, brought to bear to help try to solve this kind of issue. Um, I want to also thank uh, Fadila for facilitating this, Dana Wusenik uh, for um, facilitating the Q's and A's, and Emma Doyle for, uh, for moving us along and for her opening remarks. Um, thank you, everybody. I thought it was very interesting, and uh, it's a great start to what is going to be a great week. Thank you. And as part of our usual opening um, to the GCFI opening ceremony, we would usually um, have Leroy, our executive secretary. Um, he would traditionally open the meeting every year by ringing the bell. Um, but this year, we are um, going to share a video of him from last year. So we hope you um, all enjoy and reminisce. It is both my privilege and my pleasure to announce 
that the 72nd Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute is now officially open. So, um, yes, so we are now pleased to announce that the 73rd annual um, GCFI meeting is now officially open and we are truly missing our dear, for our, our dear friend Leroy Craswell, our executive secretary. Um, so please stay with us. We're going to now transition to our annual, meeting, our annual um, business meeting which is coming up next. And here in this um, session, you can learn more about GCFI's work and also participate in shaping our future directions. So please um, stand by as we transition to um, this meeting. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Let's continue into our annual membership meeting. Thank you to those of you who are staying online and thank you to anyone else who's joined us, especially for this membership meeting. My name is Emma Doyle. I'm currently the vice chair of GCFI. Today I'm acting as chair in place of Martin Russell, who unfortunately can't be with us. Um, this annual membership meeting is when you can learn what GCFI has been doing in the past 12 months um, since our membership meeting at GCFI 72 in Punta Cana. We've listened to feedback from members and we're aiming for transparency and we want to ensure your participation in decisions about GCFI. So if you are a member in good standing, then you can take part in the election of board members plus the election of a new chair and a vice chair today. Now, am I going to be able to share my screen please? for dealer and team. Yes, um, you should have um, on the bottom yeah. panel, there's something that says share screen. Perfect, all right, let me go to that. All right, so 2020 hasn't been a regular year for anyone, but Martin and I have counted on excellent um, support and participation of the board of directors and the officers of GCFI, who I take the chance to formally thank. We also are fortunate to have strong partnerships that have been, that have ensured continuity in our work. And our director, Bob Blazer, will speak uh, more about our grants, but I'd like to formally thank all our partners and sponsors. Now, during Martin and my term as chair and vice chair, we've held a number of virtual meetings for the board and for committees, but this is GCFI's very first virtual membership meeting. So now in matters of housekeeping, please know that participants uh, currently have their microphones disabled. So please raise your hand if you'd like to speak. And you can also feel free again to type your comments into the Q&A box or comment in the chat box, okay? Now, Chris Corbin has offered to take notes, uh, take the minutes for us today. Um, Chris, I'm just wondering if you can give us a, can you give us the signal that you're there? Perhaps you can raise your hand for me. Uh, Fadila, can you confirm if you're seeing Chris online? Yeah, Chris Hi. should also yes. be able to um, speak. Yes, there we go. Yes, thank you. Uh, morning, ev everyone. Thank you, Emma. Yes, here and, and starting the note-taking process. Perfect. <laughs> thank you very much, Chris. All right, well, at this point, um, I would normally call on Leroy as our executive secretary to determine whether we have a quorum for this meeting. Um, under our bylaws, in his absence, the chair takes on the role of executive secretary. And I feel like Leroy, Leroy always liked to give me tasks to do at GCFI, so his spirit continues in this sense. Um, but can I just check in with um, Bob? Do we have a quorum for this meeting. Can you give us a thumbs up? We're still counting. Hopefully we do. I'll let you know uh, in uh, three minutes. <laughs> All right, great, thanks. The, okay, we've got an hour for this meeting. Let me, let me continue on while Bob does that. Um, I want to show the, I'd like to show you the agenda for our, for our meeting. Um, 
we have, oh, let me, let me, let me put this away. Okay, so on our, on our, um, on the screen here is the agenda. This was also emailed to all the members of GCFI who are in good standing. Now we have four main agenda items to look at. Firstly, accepting the minutes from last year. Um, I'll give you a summary of our committee work. We have our executive director's report. We have some board nominations and we have an update from our program director about our hopes for GCFI 74 next year. Now, at the very start of this meeting, I just want to mention to everybody in relation to nominations, I want to flag that if you're a member in good standing that you will have received an email for the SurveyMonkey link for voting. So can you please be sure to have that on hand? It looks like this um, with the green borders. Um, we do want to give you a chance to hear about what GCFI looks for in board members and who the nominees are from the chair of the nominations committee, Nancy. Um, we wanted you to have a chance to ask any questions that you might have. So we'll do that in probably the next half hour and then we'll close the voting and announce the results before the end of the meeting. And as we said, there's been really great interest in joining the board. So there's, um, there's some very good candidates. Madam Chair? So, yes. We have a quorum. Excellent, thank you very much, Bob. All right, let's move ahead then with our full um, GCFI 73 membership meeting. I would like to ask if there is any other business that we should be adding to today's agenda. Does anyone have anything that they would like to add? And let me check our, in our chat box, do we have any? And there doesn't seem to be anything in the chat Perfect. box or in the Q&A. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much. So our next agenda item um, is to look at the minutes from last year's meeting that was held in Punta Cana. It was held on the Tuesday afternoon during GCFI and um, the minutes were sent to members in advance of today's meeting. I also have them here on the screen in very short and very um, small format, but I would like to ask if anyone has any comments on these minutes. Did I see a Q&A? No. Okay, I would then like us to put these minutes to your vote for approval. Can we please call up a poll for uh, members? Uh, one second. Okay, we'll go to a poll. Um, and you, as members of GCFI, you have a chance to vote on this to acknowledge that these minutes are a correct and accurate record of what we spoke about last year. Um, Emma, can we just circle back to that in a second? Um, I'll put up the poll. Um, we, uh, my role has changed slightly, so I don't have the poll option, okay. but it will be up in a few minutes. All right, okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, our next agenda item then is to look at the work of GCFI's committees. Um, did you know that GCFI has 12 committees in total, uh, which contribute to, the, the, to GCFI achieving its objectives each year? Now, there are two different types of committees at GCFI. We have standing committees. These ones are program, publications, student awards, nominations, and communications. The, the members of those committees are drawn from the board of directors. Then we have a number of ad hoc committees, including a committee on fisher engagement, diversity and equality, strategic planning, board performance, historical committee and an education committee. And those committees are comprised of members of the board, as well as any members of GCFI who would like to contribute to these areas um, and to contribute to GCFI's work on those areas. Now, in the interest of time and for clarity of audio, I'm going to give you a quick summary of the key efforts of these committees in the past year. Uh, I want to be quick, but I am also thinking of our hardworking translators. Um, I think it's important that members know what, what goes on in between the GCFI meetings. 
Um, so I want to just touch on each of these. The program committee, first up, let's start with that. Thank you, firstly, to the program committee for organising an excellent opening keynote this morning. Now, for the first time, we also have a number of thematic keynote speakers this week. You might like to, let me go to the program, you might like to check out Dr. Warren Potts, who will be speaking about recreational fisheries on Tuesday at 10.15 in the, in the special session. Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Cesar Toro from UNESCO, who will be speaking on Thursday morning, and Dr. Yvette Dioidi from FAO will be speaking that morning. So try and join in for those. Now in planning this overall schedule for GCFI 73, like Bob said, we tried to balance science and fun and we wanted to try and overcome that online meeting fatigue that everyone is feeling. So one of the things that we're doing that's a little bit different this year is e-posters. Um, in total, when I last checked, there were 56 posters, I believe, and they're all in this very cool learning box, uh, learning toolbox format. Now you can sign into the event this evening to um, join up with those in the session on e-posters. And you can also uh, check out the posters throughout this year, they'll be saved online. We, in the program, I wanna highlight and I would like to thank EDF for sponsoring this year's special session on recreational fisheries management in the past 10 years. So on Tuesday morning, Wednesday and Friday mornings from 10 a.m., you can join the session on recreational fisheries. Now on Wednesday night, there's a Cine Fish Festival as usual. Um, we have a Fisher Forum on Thursday lunchtime, 12 o'clock. And we have a new item, uh, the Story Slam, which is going to be held at, at our closing along with the fabulous Kingfish Trio musical band from 5 p.m. for the official closing of GCFI 73. Okay. Next, we have the Publications Committee. And the most important news to report there is that the online proceedings of GCFI are now up to date to GCFI 71. And by the end of this week, I'm assured that GCFI 72 will also be up to date. So if you've submitted your extended abstract to Leroy in the past, then you'll be pleased to know that nearly all of those are now online. So that's great progress. Thank you very much to the Publications Committee for that. Um, also know that in terms of publications, the partnership between GCFI and the Gulf and Caribbean Research Journal continues. So please be aware that if you're a member of GCFI and if you present at GCFI, then you can also submit an article based on your presentation to this journal for peer reviewed publication. That's free for members and it's open access. Okay, back, let me go back to our committees. Moving on to the next committee, the Student Awards Committee. Um, we, the travel awards from last year will roll over to next year, we hope. Um, this year, there's no judging of students for the e-posters, so students can relax a little. Um, also interesting is that on the GCFI website, there's now a do not, uh, there's now a donate button, uh, donate now, where people can donate to the Jerry Corso Fund for students to top up, uh, to hopefully top up the fundraising for student travel in future and for student activities. The nominations committee, I'm going to let Nancy address this, but I would like to thank the committee for responding to input from last year and seeking to increase transparency in our board member elections. Uh, we currently have a very engaged board. Uh, we're keen to have board members that bring a range of experience to GCFI. We aim for regional representation. We want to increase diversity. And we need board members who are enthusiastic and capable of assisting GCFI. Nancy will tell us more about uh, the board members shortly, the board nominees shortly. The communications committee has been active as ever, uh, which is actually very good because communications are now more important than ever. Uh, we aim to make the web website more user friendly and more search engine optimised. We continue with list serves and with GCFI's social media channels, as you can see here. Now, the ad hoc committees in which members can participate, 
Fisher Engagement Committee is working hard to strengthen connect connections with fishers, especially those fishers through the Gladding Memorial Award. Uh, they're working to overcome obstacles to remote networking among fishers. Uh, this year, unfortunately, there won't be a Gladding Memorial Award given. Um, please do join in though um, Thursday for the Fisheries for Fishers Forum, Thursday lunchtime. We have um, a strategic planning committee that has been quite active. We, it's time to update our five year strategic plan. That's underway and you could keep an eye out for updates and news on that soon. Um, we have a board performance committee which is active behind the scenes to ensure that GCFI has the human resources and any allocation of funding that's necessary to achieve our objectives. Um, diversity and equality, historical committee and education exist and continue but no major news to report this year. Are there any questions so far? Um, there don't appear to be any questions in either the chat or the um, Q and A. Um, I do want to note that the polls are ready whenever you are. All right. So let's go back to the meeting minutes and to access the poll that should be appearing on your screen right now. And um, it says, "Do you accept the GCFI 72 membership meeting minutes?" If you're there please click on one of the options here, yes, no, or abstain. And we'll take a moment to let that go through. And then from there, do you want to take a minute to let that come in for Dila? Do you want to come back to us with the result? Sure, that's not a problem. Okay, all right. Then I would like to ask if I can pass the microphone over please to Bob Glazer uh, to give his executive director's report and update us on some of the financial aspects of GCFI in the last year and going forward for the next year. Thank you, Emma. Uh, and thanks everybody for sticking around. This is actually one of the most important parts of GCFI. It's really where you, the membership and the interested people, um, find out what GCFI is all about. Um, my puppy is making a, is playing with something here, so I apologize for the extra noise. Um, so I would like to, uh, first of all, before we get to the financial aspects, I would like to just uh, discuss a few things. Um, GCFI is much more than a meeting. Uh, as you've already heard from Admiral Gallaudet, uh, GCFI is MPA Connect. MPA Connect, of course, uh, is a network uh, and a community of MPA practitioners that have come together to really work uh, collectively to um, address a lot of the issues associated with uh, ecosystem management. And so uh, we're quite proud of the, of the work that's been done under that. Uh, this has been an ongoing activity for about the last 10 years. So. Uh, it's really built in terms of the activities that it does, as well as um, the, the spatial scope of the um, MPAs that are part of this activity. I also want to bring up a couple other ones. And one is, uh, for those of you that are not aware, GCFI is part of a uh, larger regional um, marine litter uh, activity. It's the uh, Caribbean node for the Global Partnership on Marine Litter. Fadila is actually um, in uh, heading a lot of these activities and we've had a number of different um, awards associated with this that uh, allow us to accomplish a lot of activities. This is a partnership between GCFI and United Nations Environment Program um, out of Kenya, but our uh, co-host the, for the node is the Caribbean Environment Program and Chris Corbin who's taking notes on this right now out of Jamaica. So uh, we're very proud of the activities that we've been able to do under this um, activity, under this, uh, these grants and um, awards. We've recently received an award from the Government of Canada, which we're very excited about because it will allow us to begin to address the issue of abandoned, lost and discarded fishing gear, ALDFG, which has become a huge uh, issue throughout the world. But this is um, an award that we were, were excited to bring to next year's GCFI. And we'll be having workshops, uh, bringing in fishers and, um, and 
hopefully moving the ball forward on that activity. Uh, so that, that the other thing that is exciting about that is that it brings together not only that important issue, but it, it sort of breaks down the stovepipes. Um, we're bringing, we're integrating this with a fisheries for fishers activity, uh, which is an initiative that GCFI created, I don't know, a dozen or so years ago, which recognizes that fishers are one of the most important components to ensuring sustainability of our resources. And so we're really um, focused on trying to ensure that they are part of the discussion. And, uh, and Emma mentioned the Gladding Memorial Award, which recognizes each year a fisher who has demonstrated a, a, a lifelong ethic for conservation in the region. We'll be uh, um, uh, using some of those fishers for fishers or, or engaging them to be part of these activities uh, just as some background, last year at the meeting, the fishers actually said that they wanted to address ALDFG uh, as one of their priority issues. So we were able to secure funding uh, from this mechanism and we're hoping a little bit coming in from UNEP to, to support the, uh, this activity. And this is done in partnership um, with the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, which is part of the Ocean Conservancy. So uh, I brought up the Fisheries for Fishers Initiative because that is really the third leg that I wanted to address, and that is the fishers, and that we are really um, focused on trying to engage them in, in uh, these activities and bring them into the, um, into the community of conservationists. And, uh, and to be honest with you, these are some of the first conservationists, so it's not really like it's a hard sell. And, um, and we're very excited that we're able to integrate all of these activities together. So I am going to actually turn over uh, the financial reporting part of this to Mel Goodwin, who's our treasurer, who can go through the documents. Um, if anybody wants any more information about some of the grants that we have, uh, they are part of the financial reports and we do have them broken out even into more granularity. But unfortunately, we don't have the time to present all of that uh, today. We're very excited about the direction GCFI is heading and um, it seems that each year it's just uh, um, becoming uh, a, an organization that has uh, a lot more ammunition to really tackle some of these issues. So um, I'd like to turn it over to Mel Goodwin, if we can, uh, who will then be presenting uh, the um, minutes or the financial reports. Thanks, Bob. We'll start with the uh, income and expense statements. And I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but we'll be happy to answer any questions either, either now or if you care to uh, send anything by email, I'll be happy to address that that way. Our overall income picture is, as you see here, a in unrestricted income on the order of $46,000, a restricted income of various grants uh, totaling slightly over $500,000. And $46,000 from various sponsors of the 72nd Institute, which gives us a total income of $597,578.21. Um, I'm going to go through all of these, and then if someone has questions, I'll be happy to address those. Emma, can we go to the next uh, page, please? These are our expenses. We had unrestricted expenses, as you can see detailed there, of $196,000. Um, about a little more than half of that is uh, expenses related to the second 72nd Institute. We had restricted fund expenses on those various grants, totaling $324,700 and a net income of $76,715. Again, I'll be happy to go over, over these things in more detail if anyone wishes that. Uh, one salient point here is that uh, in the case of most of these grants, uh, about 10% eventually, 10 to 15% eventually ends up as being unrestricted income. So the, um, as that relates to GCFI overhead. So a lot of these expenses that you see as unrestricted actually do get covered eventually by some of the restricted funds when, uh, when we receive them as overhead monies. Can we go to the next page, please? 
And this is our balance sheet. The critical thing here is that our total cash on deposit that is restricted and unrestricted as of September 30th is $321,000. And um, in terms of liabilities, we have $377 in payable taxes and accrued expenses, which are primarily American Express charges that haven't been, uh, been covered as yet. This is fairly typical. Um, our fund balance, which is, would be equity in a private corporation, is $373,691, which for a nonprofit organization is pretty good. So let's go to the last page, please. And this is our budget for the fiscal year that we are in now, extending to the 30th of September next year. And what we see is uh, these budgets that we do are always intended to be fairly conservative in terms of uh, not over projecting income and not under projecting expenses. So what we see is that uh, we expect to have some pretty significant uh, restricted grants in the coming year. Um, our restricted income is conservatively, conservatively projected at around $15,000. And our expenses are, uh, as you see, detailed uh, mostly grant funded expenses for a total of $677,000. So now I think I'll ask if there are any questions or I perhaps should ask Bob if there's anything he'd like to add or amplify on, on any of that information. Yeah, so just a couple of things. Um, I just want to emphasize what Mel said there, uh, that this, the first few pages that he presented were actually for our fiscal year, our last fiscal year, which was uh, October 1st, um, 2019 to September 30th, uh, 2020. It represents a snapshot. That is, that it's what our budget, our our financial position was on September 30th. Uh, and I think that that's important to realize because this is a very dynamic kind of process. And if we had done it one or three days later, for example, things might look a little bit different, but still in the ballpark. But this is you know, how we ha have to run our books. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out is that we will need to vote to approve these two budgets. Um, last year's budget, as well as the one that says budget on this page, which is for the upcoming year, it's not, as Mel mentioned, it's conservative, but it's not meant to be exact and precise. Uh, so it, it's meant to anticipate where we think we're going, um, what we know that we have on hand. And, uh, and I think that, that it's a pretty good representation of that. Um, as you can see, we're in good shape financially, uh, and thus we are able to do a lot of the activities that we've been able to accomplish throughout the, throughout the year. Um, and I, I I believe, oh yeah, one other thing I wanted to mention is for those of you who are new to these business meetings, we do have those, he mentioned restricted and unrestricted funds. Restricted funds are those funds which are earmarked for very specific activities and we cannot use them on other activities. Unrestricted funds are those that we have um, available in the bank to use on GCFI activities, whatever uh, priorities that we or the board has deemed are appropriate. So those are two very specific, um, and very different accounts, and they're kept separate in very and separate bank accounts. Uh, and as soon as we spend something in a restricted fund, then we'll transfer it to unrestricted because we have essentially um, incurred those costs, and they will then become available to our unrestricted account. So I hope that that uh, I hope that was helpful, and I want to thank Mel for presenting uh, the budget. Um, it's not a trivial deal to put together these budgets. So I, I appreciate the efforts that he does on this. Okay, then, uh, do we have any, any other questions from, uh, from any of the participants right now? Um, currently in the chat box or the question and answer um, segment, there are no questions currently. Um, we have had, oh, we do have a question. Question. Okay, so I can see that uh, we have a question here asking, are there long running, long run or long term financial targets? For example, are there strategic goals 
for example, to increase to a certain level or identified minimums uh, where we should worry if we drop below a specific amount. Who would like to take that question? So I'll take a first stab at that. Um, GCFI five years ago or six years ago actually now uh, developed its first strategic plan and in it we identified what objectives we wanted to accomplish in the, um, in the previous five years, which I'm pretty pleased to report we've accomplished most of those. Um, one of those was to make us financially solvent and I do believe that um, we've accomplished that. Uh, in terms of what thresholds we do not want to drop below, we um, we haven't said that we want to keep it at a certain balance, but uh, we are, I think, on track to ensuring that um, our activities can increase as we increase our income. Um, but the strategic financial objectives are included in that five-year strategic plan, and um, we will be uh, updating that plan. It's in the process of happening right now under the strategic planning committee. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, and I, I would also flag that we remember that we do have an ad hoc committee, the board performance committee and um, Holden, if that's something that you're interested in getting involved in that is open uh, to board members and to all meeting all, all um, members. And that's a committee that looks at um, some of these sort of questions about allocation of resources and overall uh, performance versus our objectives. So that's a good question. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions? Otherwise, if everybody can please vote. Um, while we're doing that, um, I would like to just highlight that there were some comments that um, came in. Number one, that the minutes of the membership meeting from GCFI 72 were accepted by the membership um, with 70, whoops, where was it? With like 80, 86% vote yes and the rest abstained. Um, then we have um, a comment on the Fisher Forum. Thank you, Will, for the reminder that the Fisher Forum this week um, in the program will focus on the impacts of COVID-19 and the pandemic on fishers in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Um, so please join for that. That's very timely and it's something that GCFI has been tracking and looking at with a number of partners um, already through and through webinars with Fishers already this year. Um, a comment from Nancy that students are always welcome to join student board, um, student committee activities too. All right, do we have a, do we have a result for poll two that um, the approval of the 2019, thank you very much. Um, yes, the um, annual financial report for 2019-2020 was accepted. Thank you very much. All right, can we show similarly a poll for the approval of the 2020-2021 budget? Um, it will be on screen shortly. That's coming. Uh, we are going to open the poll. Okay, we'll wait for you to do that before we continue on to the next one. I hope everybody's pleased to have their say in the democracy of GCFI. Um, we are making the most of the online meeting facility. Uh, this is new territory for us. Uh, we're pleased to be able to have you engaged and participating here with us today. This is a great turnout. Thanks, everyone. We're nearly, uh, we're halfway through our, our agenda and we'll get this poll coming to you. If there are any other questions or comments, feel free to type those in. So our next vote is going to be on approving the 2020 financial report. That's a forecast for the coming year that Mel explained. Um, okay, if you'd like to go to the poll on your screen and please participate, do you accept the finan annual financial report for 2020-21 consisting of the income and expenses statements and the supplemental grant accounting documents that Mel and Bob talked through? 
please participate in that poll. Yes, no, or feel free to abstain. Um, and while we let those results come in, let's move on to our next agenda item, which is to talk about board nominations. And I would like to ask if Nancy will please, Nancy Peterson Brown will please take, or Nancy Brown Peterson, please take the uh, microphone um, our, as chair of our GCFI nominations committee. Um, Nancy is also the immediate past chair of GCFI, so she's been very involved with Martin and I this year, and we thank her tremendously for that, actually over the last three years. Um, Nancy, are okay. you there? Yes, can you guys hear me? I unmuted. Can you hear yes. me? Okay, great. I don't see myself, but I don't know if you guys see me or not. I, I, I oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm very glad to see people here at the meeting. This year, we have five positions available in the Board of Directors. And based on comments that we received from the membership last year, we had comments that the way that we went about nominating the Board of Directors was not as transparent as it could be. Typically, the board would vote on, on nominees and then present a slate to the membership for approval. So in the interest of transparency, this year, we have presented all nominees who passed the initial test of eligibility, which is you have to be a GCFI, current GCFI member, and you also need to have attended two of the past three GCFI meetings. So the board voted on the nine nominees. And if you wanna um, go splash up to the next slide, that would be great. So we had nine nominees that actually um, passed this quote test. And I want to thank all nine of these people for their interest in contributing to GCFI. This is probably, I think this is the most number of nominees that we've ever had. So kudos to the uh, engagement of the membership. Like I said, we have five positions available. Four of our existing board members, um, Alfonso, Dalila, Michelle, and Terry, pictured there, are asking to re-up their board membership for an additional four years. In Dalila and Terry's case, it's it's they they have been member they were elected for a two-year term and now they would like to be elected to, for a full four-year term. The other five nominees, Alex, Bertha, Bill, Holden, and Eric, are what we finally term as newbies. <laughs> they, they, they are our new nominees to, um, for a, a position on the board. All paid up GCFI members should have received by separate email a letter explaining this entire process as well as a vote. There it is. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. I am hoping that if you're a member, you voted on these five nominees. Um, the poll is going to be closed here in like one minute. <laughs> So if you haven't voted, go find that, um, that email and vote very quickly. It's going to take us a little bit of time to um, put, the, put the votes together. And probably in a little bit, I will announce the, um, the winners of our, five, of, of our voting and who the next five new members will be to the GCFI board. Again, I thank all nine of you pictured here for your willingness to participate in this. Um, once, and I also want to thank Alex Tufik, who is a current board member who is stepping down from the board this year. He has moved from Belize to Canada and his job responsibilities have changed and so he elected to step off the board. So we will have at least one new face and, you know, maybe, maybe more, we'll, we'll find out. Meanwhile, while we're hopefully tabulating votes on this, I want to talk about the chair and vice chair. This year we are nominating a chair and a vice chair. I think you can move, if you want to move forward, Emma, to the next, the next uh, picture. <laughs> um, last year, as you know, we extended Martin and Emma's positions for an additional year due to rather exceptional circumstances. We had difficulty identifying a new chair and they were doing such a wonderful job. We um, saddled them with doing it for another year and they've done a great, a great job. This year we do have a, a nominee for um, GCFI chair, um, Henry Valles from Barbados. Henry was a vice was vice chair four years ago when I was chair. He was my vice chair. He's been with GCFI for 
quite a while. He's also currently heading up the strategic planning committee and has done a lot of good work. He's got a lot of really good ideas forward thinking about where we need to go with GCFI. Our vice chair nominee is Joanna Pitt from Bermuda. Joanna has also been an active GC GCFI member for a number of years and represents that very important Bermuda connection. Joanna is active in the, um, both the communications, the program and the student awards committee and she has taken over working on the um, silent auction for the student awards the past two years and has raised it to really wonderful new levels. So in the same email where you, you know, were asked to vote on board of director nominees, you were also asked to um, either vote yes or abstain on the chair and the vice chair. I am certainly hoping that Henry and Joanna will be our new chair and vice chair since they don't have any competition. But again, we'll wait until we get the results of the uh, poll to let everybody know. At this point, if any of the membership has questions about the nomination process or, or wants clarity, um, please feel free to put something in the chat or the Q&A and I will at attempt to answer it as we wait for the final poll results. Thank you very much, Nancy. Um, if there are any questions or comments also on, um, on the, any comments on the, so far on the, um, on the part, on the nominees themselves, feel free to ask. Do we have any questions or comments? Any raised hands? Any chat message? All members any? received biographies of all of the nominees as well as a statement of interest. So I'm really hoping that you took a chance to read that. Because that would that gave a lot of information about who all these nine people are, what their interests are, how they feel they can contribute to GCFI, which is important as we are looking, looking to have the board be representative of our entire membership, as well as representative of people that are gonna roll up their sleeves and dig in and work. So yeah, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of facets that go to making a good board member. And the board did, did feel that all nine of these nominees had the qualities necessary to be good board members. Okay, well, everyone, I hope you're able to go to the Survey Monkey um, survey here. We will close this off probably in about two minutes. And I think what we, let's go to Alejandro and let's ask, Let's um, go to him and come back to um, come back to Nancy once those once that poll is closed. We'll give two minutes more, and um, in the meantime, Alejandro, can I ask yes. you to take the microphone? And Nancy will come back to you. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to see all of you here. Although I'm used to see you live, face to face. But this has been a very different kind of year in all, all the sense. Uh, so I just want to give an update for the next year, 2021 GCFI. We're still ho hoping to be able to do a face-to-face. -face. Uh, we have more time to prepare in case than still we are in a different situation. But I think I'm very optimistic to have a face-to-face -face meeting, even if we have to, to have social distancing and all those kind of things. Uh, menu, we're still considering to use for Walton Beach. Uh, Alex Fox have been grateful to continue uh, with the interest and all the support and we need to go there. We, early in the year, we visited, I visited the, the area and I met with different partners and institutions and the convention center and all that. And I think the venue was perfect for this year, but. It will be all ready for next year and we're ready to be there. The dates that we have at this moment will be November 6th to the 12th of 2021. Uh, we already have the convention center and the hotel selected. And at the same time, we have been working with partners from different institutions and national and international organizations and they are very much interested in bringing new capacity approach and new strategies to GCFI and you will see some of them uh, later, later in the program. I wanna take a minute uh, about the program. I have five minutes and I think I, I wanna talk up something about this year program. This year program was 
a challenging because it was something completely new for us to go directly into a virtual situation. The poster section was something that we have been working for the last two years or a year and a half to put together. And I think it's going to be a very successful uh, poster section and something that we will continue using. I want to highlight three people who have been very involved with the program committee, Fadila, Joanna, and Michelle. Without them, I will be completely lost. I mean, they, it, it has been an incredible partnership working with them and a great pleasure to do that. They're very positive per, uh, team and ready to step up at any time under any situation. So I think the experience for this year going virtual will not go away. I, I can see very easily that we're gonna continue having some kind of virtual sections in the future, even if we're meeting face to face. Like the post e poster will be something that we're gonna highlight for the future. Uh, I'm looking forward to see all of you in November next year in Fort Walton Beach. Uh, there will be very interesting special sections and new approaches. And if we, I think we are all looking forward to see each other. It's been a, a, a long year without having the human contact among ourselves. And that's what GCFI is, is all about. Uh, so you asked me for five minutes. I think that was five minutes, Emma. I can talk more, but I think that's what we, I wanted to say about next year meeting. All right, perfect. Thank you, Alejandro. Let's, um, let's all hope that it will be, will be possible for us to get together. Um, do we, okay, Nancy and Fadila, how are we doing? Do we have a, an outcome to report, for Nancy to report? Um, yes, that's correct. Um, I let's pass that to, let's pass that back to Nancy to report yep. on then. I, I emailed you um, a slide um, with the five, Nancy. Um, okay. I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> I'll wait, there it is. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Why, so if I st I've stopped screen sharing, uh, Nancy, can you please share your screen then? Or Fadila, um, whoever is going to... Um, I'll let Fadila do it. Okay. okay. So I will share my screen. Um... So the nominations committee is very pleased to announce, and I'm trying to... Our, <laughs> our five new board members, um, Alfonso Aguila Pereira, Dalila Aldana Aranda, Michelle Shar, Bertha Simmons, and Eric Wade. And we, we welcome, um, especially Bertha and Eric, as new members to the board. We welcome back Alfonso, Dalila, and Michelle as re-upping board members. Um, at this point, I would also like to thank Terry Donaldson for his service on the board. I imagine um, next year we will have actual plaques for this. I'm assuming also that the, um, that the voting came in and did approve Henry and Joanna as chair and vice chair, and I congratulate them. And I also want to give a really huge thanks and um, acknowledgement to both Martin and Emma for doing a fantastic job as chair and vice chair for not just the normal two-year stint, but for three years. So Henry, I am guessing that after this meeting, you will take over the reins with the um, ample help of Joanna. Um, new um, Bertha and Eric, you will be receiving an email to be included in the, um, in the Meet the Board social on Thursday night because we want all of our board members there. Um, past board members are also invited as well. Like Terry, please come in also, especially as a member of the Student Awards Committee because Student Awards Committees are always at the uh, board social. So any questions? Like I said, congratulations, everybody. This is my last official act as a, uh, on the GCFI board. I actually stepped off last year, but I retained my position as past chair. Martin is now officially past chair, so I'm officially off the board. So thank everybody very much. Bye-bye. Well, congratulations to our new board members and to our returning board members and a tremendous thanks uh, to 
Alex and to Terry who've served well and who I'm sure we will continue to have involved in GCFI. Terry from the distance of Guam who's been such a uh, great participant over many years from a great distance and um, also huge congratulations to um, uh, to Joe as vice chair taking my place and to Henry. Um, I know that we, based on Alejandro's hopes that we will be in Fort Walton next year, I know that um, Alex is going to be very involved with GCFI. He'll be on our, pro, continue to be on our program committee. So he's a key person still. And um, Holden, we know we can count on you to keep involved. And uh, we look forward to you all continuing to be involved over the years going forward. Um, all right, with that, Nancy, a tremendous thank you to you as um, outgoing immediate past chair and thank you for your hard work. There is a lot of work involved in the nominations committee and we really thank you for that. Martin and I have created a lot of work for you, so thank you. Um, there is no other business on our agenda. So I think, unless I have forgotten anything, um, we, we can go over to video. Fadila, and I'll probably give Bob a last say. We do have a, a little bit of video that we'd like to close with. Bob, would you like to make any comments? Sure, thank you very much, Emma, yeah. and thanks for your service on the board, and thanks to Martin, even though he couldn't join us. Um, I, do, I did want to end this uh, meeting with the, the video that we have uh, to share here, um, and it's, I think it's, it sort of speaks to how we all feel about GCFI. And, uh, and it's by our dear friend and colleague, Leroy. Um, Fadila, you want to cue it up? And go. My name is Leroy Cresswell. I'm with the University of Florida Sea Grant program. And I first came, interestingly enough, I was at the University of Miami Rasmus in 1980. And Rasmus is where GCFI started. And so since 1980 until now, that's 36 years, I have been coming to GCFI every year. I am the executive secretary of the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute. And my job is I'm the editor of the proceedings. I make sure that happens. And whatever else I'm asked to do, uh, making plaques for student awards and things like that. So I'm one of the old dogs of GCFI. And the reason that's the case is because back in the 80s and it continues today, GCFI is really a family of individuals because I've seen people from Barbados, from the Caribbean region, from Barbados and Mexico and you name it, Bermuda, that I see every, I've seen every year for 36 years because they come and we talk about things that are important and what's really seems to, where GCFI has really caught hold is that we have so many students to come now. And it's, it's indicative in our, in our student achievement awards, all of our student awards, when they come and they, and they give a presentation, they get an award for doing a fine job. We don't just give them an award, we give them the money to come to next year's meeting. And that's because we want people to, as some of the other uh, students that you spoke with, we want them to become like me say I've been coming to GCFI for 36 years because it's so important and it's so pleasurable and so that that that's the important thing to me and I probably when I retire which is pretty soon I still will come to GCFI just because it's my home hey thank you very much Good perfect enough. that's Good. All right, well, that was some video that we recorded at GCFI Cayman in, um, in 2016. Uh, 20, yes, 2016. Which is great to, great to have on file. Um, and the, that was some of the video that we used for a video called GCFI Family, which is, um, which is on our YouTube channel. Now, our keynote from today will also be available on YouTube. And we are recording this meeting, so if anybody needs to refer back to it, then we'll also be able to see it for posterity. Um, 
on that fabulous note of the spirit of GCFI, um, I would like to bring our GCFI 73 membership meeting to a close. And thank you everybody for your support. And I hope that we'll see each other throughout this week at the different activities on the agenda. Please go to uh, gcfi.org to check out the program and um, make sure that you follow us on social media. Keep in touch. Don't hesitate to drop any of us a note if you need anything. And um, as Bob says, if anybody has any questions regarding budgets, operational issues, you can reach out to our executive director, Bob Glazer, on his email, bob.glazer at gcfi.org. Thank you to our translators for working, um, working so hard this morning and um, everybody keep well and uh, keep in touch. Congratulations um, to the new board members and we look forward to seeing you further this week. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everyone, and see you all at 5 p.m. Eastern time for our opening social, which will be the GCFI 73 happy hour. And then we'll have the e poster session starting at 6 p.m. Eastern time, which will be 7 p.m. Caribbean time. So see everyone later today. Thank you. Bye. Bye.